No, I'm, I'm very glad to be able to address you. And obviously, the Irish presidency of the EU is important. Of course, I understand that Ireland has, of course, uh, more immediate concerns with the economic crisis, clearly, as other countries in Europe. But nevertheless, uh, one should not forget about the future if you're struggling with the present. Huh? That's very, very important. And often the solution for the current problems lies precisely in long-term thinking. Huh? So we can address this a little bit later in the discussion. I'm also aware that climate change is a big issue in Ireland right now. At breakfast, I picked up the Irish Times, which is a world-class newspaper. And uh, you will discover that sometimes I have an inclination for irony. I warn you from the beginning <laughs> about this. But they have a, run a very good series on climatic change, actually. Yeah? So it was about thinning of Arctic sea ice and the, the big drought in the United States last year, which has a major impact on food production. And uh, the Kansas farmers still believe it has nothing to do with climate change. Uh, so they, I guess, because if you've ever been to Kansas, the, the Kansas farmers, I'm sure, still also believe that the world is flat. It's a very flat country. <laughs> OK. So, why two degrees matter? And uh, this two degrees, of course, is to be seen in, in two respects here. I personally actually helped to create this target of two degrees, which is now adopted by many nations. And it came about actually in 1994 when I was advising the then German environment minister, Angela Merkel, who is somehow known now for other issues. <laughs> and uh, when this uh, sort of, we called it at that time, tolerable windows approach, in the sense you do not try to predict the future. So if the economy develops in a certain way, then you will have that type of emissions, and then you will have a certain amount of global warming, but you ask the other way around. You say, what is the maximum global warming we could digest without major social disruptions, for example? And after the, a long debate, we said two degrees is, of course, it's not whether it's 2.1 or 1.9 or whatever, or maybe even 2.3, but around two degrees, we probably will see a qualitative change in climate impacts, huh? and I'll uh, elaborate a little bit on that. So two degrees came into the world. Other people as well have asked for it. So it became, in a sense, a fantastic success story for international target setting. The question is, of course, can we hold the two degrees line now that it is internationally accepted? And the other thing is, what if not? So currently, the world is on a trajectory. If you <laughs> just uh, sum up the pledges made after Copenhagen, we are on a course towards a 3.5 to 4 degrees warming by the end of the century. And by the way, this is not the end of the story, as I will show you. And yeah, what does it mean? And the World Bank asked us, to do a little study in the beginning, four degrees warming, what does it mean in particular for poverty reduction, for the subtropics and tropics, and the answer is it would just thwart all our efforts for poverty reduction, really. Yeah? So the two degrees is, on the one hand, two degrees, and it's four degrees, two plus two. No? What would it mean? And we have a choice, clearly. So. Now, let me go back a little bit, because I'm sure also in Ireland there has been this debate about is global warming happening at all? Are humans causing it? And wouldn't be the, the, the effects rather benign, actually? So this, uh, let me, so Al Gore, you know, came up with this narrative, an inconvenient truth. One, the Peace Nobel Prize for it, and I think an Oscar <coughs> in Hollywood. And so this was the, the, the big time of, of the climate debate. Now, of course, this 
was became targeted by many groups who have vested interests. I mean, let's not forget that still oil, although cheap oil will not exist much longer, <coughs> cheap oil, you can have all types of expensive oil, of course, uh, shale oil and so on. But cheap oil will be gone in 20 or 30 years from now. But still, it's the biggest business on earth. If you look at the Fortune 500 ranking uh, of the 12 biggest companies in the world, either produce oil or distribute oil or depend on oil directly. Yeah? So it's the biggest. So of course, if you have people who warn about climate change, this cannot be unnoticed. Uh, and we have been all types of campaigns against it. So we have now replaced this what I call a cynical anti-narrative, and it goes, instead of talking about inconvenient truths, we, people have started to talk about the convenient untruths, actually four of them. First one is, there is no global warming. If yes, humankind has nothing to do with it. If we accept that, nevertheless, impacts of climate change will be marginal, if not benign, and force it's too late for mitigation. Eh? So you can summarize it in man-made climate change is a hoax and nothing in the world can stop it. Eh? And it's really true. That's what I witness every day, really. Eh? So you have uh, various contradictory, actually, positions. Eh? People argue about it. In the end, they say it's too late, although it's non-existent. Eh? So, this is vindication for non-action. I'll quickly deal with that so you know most of the things. But something really interesting happened last year. You know the Koch brothers in billionaires in, in the United States uh, who funded a study done by Berkeley scientists, some of them I know well, and uh, including Saul Pelmut, a Nobel laureate in physics. And this was about is global warming real at all? So they said, we look at the data. We do not leave it just to University of East Anglia or NASA and on. So we look at all the data. And we use the best statistical evidence we can find. So, you know, I'm a theoretical physicist by training, and our natural uh, arrogance tells us that meteorologists are not up to the state of the science. So move in the theoretical physicist, and then we will see the real picture. Now, that's the real picture. What came out of it? Now, let me see. Yeah, that even works. So this is the black line is the global mean temperature evolution since 1750, you know. So there has been all types of fluctuations. And it's going up like this. Now, in blue and green and red, you have the sort of conventional meteorological uh, observations and then here, the black one again, so is the Berkeley Earth Project. And you see it all converges onto one line. Eh? So there is no difference whatsoever. So Richard Muller, who ran this project, uh, did an editorial for the New York Times, uh, called me a converted skeptic. Eh? This was, of course, ignored by the Koch brothers who uh, funded the research. But uh, this is a very powerful message. So you can tick this off. And for example, my colleague Stefan Ramstorff did this type of analysis here. He took the global data series and removed the natural variability, for example, El Nino events. Yeah? People often argue that climate change has come to a stop since 1998, because in 1998 we have a, had a sort of monster El Nino event. What happens in an El Nino year? The oceans transmit heat to the atmosphere. In a La Nina year, in a cool year, the other thing happens, uh, just the reverse. So there was a massive release of heat from the oceans at that time. And you have to appreciate that the oceans are a huge, huge, huge energy store. So the three meters top ocean layer contains as much heat as the entire atmosphere just the first three meters. So if there are sort of 
currents, circulation patterns, and so on. You can easily, of course, change the appearance of global warming. But if you remove all the trends, you see this is what is going on with global warming. I and mean, you have a clearly linear trend, which is, if you look deeply into the meta logarithmic trend, and that was predicted by Svente Arrhenius, the Swedish Nobel laureates in chemistry, by the way, in 1896 already. Yeah? So Arrhenius' law is more or less vindicated all the time. Huh? So what a triumph. After 100 years, we come back to Arrhenius. So there is no anthropogenic interference with the climate system. What is the reason for global warming? And here I give you just uh, one number. If you look it up at uh, James Powell's website, who is an eminent geologist, there have been about 14,000 peer-reviewed papers since uh, 1991 uh, on climate change, the reasons for climate change, and just 24 of them deny that humans are involved. Uh, that is, and you have to really appreciate that, this is the ratio of 99.83% uh, versus 0.17%. This is a sort of Stalinistic outcome. Huh? If you would have an election in a, uh, yeah, whatever country, <laughs> you would have. Uh, so this is even too good to be true, I would say, as a scientist. If you would have in a medical treatment a scientific evidence of that preponderance, I would not even believe it. But it is as it is, really. Huh? So clearly, science speaks with one voice here. And um, by the way, the Berkeley project did also this thing here. They tried to use Arrhenius' 100 years old formula, the natural logarithm of CO2 concentration, uh, removed the volcanic eruptions, of course, which are just punctuations. Uh, and when we included solar activity, it didn't change anything. So we came up with this red line, you see, which fits perfectly well the development. Uh. So that's the scientific evidence here. I skip that. And then, of course, the third convenient untruth, we don't have to worry about global warming. Huh? So even four degrees is nice, uh, in particular for the Scottish, for example, <laughs> or, or the Russians, anyway. Uh, and we did this report for the World Bank, which created a major planetary waves, if you like, and has actually had a deep influence on the attitude towards climate change of the president uh, of the World Bank. And he keeps now reiterating that this is the biggest threat for human development in this century. And uh, so we had quotes from Mary Robinson, for example, from El Gore, from Ban Ki-moon, from Kofi Annan, Nick Stern, and so on. So it was a huge event, and in particular, it went viral in the social networks, which is a good thing, because I think without a social movement in the end, driven in particular by young people, we will not be able to deal with that crisis. So, so Ban Ki-moon more or less uh, said, it is my hope that this report shocks us into action. Now here, again, you know, if you talk in particular to economists, they tell you the shock and awe strategy never works. Eh? If you just tell people how gloomy the future is and so on, they will just get resistant against it. They will not listen to you anymore. But this isn't true either. I mean, of course, you need to see the opportunities of doing something about climate change, yeah? if you are a business person. Decarbonization also has to pay off, clearly. Yeah? But on the other hand, the public opinion on climate change in in US has completely changed after Hurricane Sandy. Yeah? So even when the taxi driver took me to the headquarters of the United Nations, uh, he told me, oh, I had a house on the beach. It's not there anymore, right? It's, it's gone. Huh? And actually, the, the garage of the United Nations were flooded during that event, and 2,000 luxury cars were destroyed. So what a blow to humanity. <laughs> BMWs, Mercedes, of all vehicles. Yeah? So even those people feel the heat now. And, uh, but I give you now a few figures, and, and that is really very important. 
And this looks complicated, but it's the most important <laughs> chart we have in the World Bank report. Huh? And uh, so bear with me for a minute here. What we did is the following. First of all, we took, took all available climate models. Huh? We do not rely anymore on just one model. We do so-called ensemble calculations, where you take all models developed in a different way and then use the averages uh, in a smart way. And here it more or less tells you we looked in towards the end of the century in a 4 degrees world. We looked for heat excursions, so heat waves, maximum temperatures across the globe which have a so-called five sigma characteristics. And sigma is regarding, is related to standard deviation for the st statisticians. Uh, so if you have a normal distribution, uh, say like traffic accidents, whatever, uh, one sigma event is something that happens uh, only once in three uh, times. Two sigma is already something 95% is excluded. A uh, five sigma event happens under normal climate conditions once in a million years. Once in a million years. And this is what you see now where you have the red color here are months where the five sigma event happens in 80% of the times actually. So you could say in a conservative way the one in a million event happens in those red colored areas every second year. And that is a complete sea change in environmental condition. And this goes in particular for the tropics, because if you go to a tropic country, you know the temperature is almost the same during the night. Now we're on a season, you have 27, 28, 29 degrees all year long, more or less. But if you add the four degrees on land, it would be six or seven degrees. And when you're completely outside the historical range of doing business, of living, of dying, and so on. So it is a completely different world. That means the old development schemes do not work anymore under these conditions. And you see, of course, the countries who cause global warming, United States, Australia, and so on, they are in blue colors here. That means they will not be pushed completely outside the historical range of variability. Yeah? So again, climate change is very unfair. This is a warning for the Indians in the Security Council, the only intervention, negative intervention, even challenging whether one should talk about security issues in the terms of climate change was the Indian ambassador, but this would be a lesson for him, namely, you see, this is about the Indian summer monsoon. And you, if we run our model, you see it fluctuates from year to year. And when you see episodes like this, where it completely collapses. Now, if in India that would happen for two or three years in a row, it would be the end of Indian agriculture, actually. Yeah? We had last year adjusted the fish a deficit of 10% or something. That was already quite devastating. Yeah? So the Indian summer monsoon is clearly one of the tipping elements in the Earth system. I come to that now. But before that, I talked about the unfairness of physics in climate change. And this is again something. Now, sea level will rise for many factors. One is simple, simply thermal expansion of seawater. No? This is a tiny effect, but summed up, it's a lot. It can provide half a meter sea level rise by the end of the century. But eventually, the big contributions will come from the ice sheets, Greenland ice sheet, West Antarctic ice sheet, and so on. Now, what will be the distribution of sea level rise? And this is now the, the inhomogeneous distribution of sea level rise. The blue <laughs> colors indicate these are the regions where sea level may, may even drop, while the red ones is where sea level will accelerate. Why? If it comes from the big ice sheet, say Greenland, now Greenland has an ice shield about two kilometers thick. Now, if it melts down and releases water, it loses mass, and that means it loses gravitational pull. 
you know, gravitation is based on the mass you have. And it's different in humans. In humans, if you lose mass, you become more attractive. For the ice sheet, it's the other way around. And uh, generally speaking only. <laughs> and no, so what means the physics means that the ice released as water from the big ice sheets will not go to the coastal waters around the ice sheets, but will go to the tropics. So again, sea level rise will much be much bigger in Tuvalu, in Nauru, in Palau, in Kiribati, in the Maldives, than on the northeast coast of the United States. Eh? So that is uh, a counterintuitive thing first, but has a major bearing on development policy. Eh? So on the tipping elements, this is a chart I have myself introduced you know, a long time ago at a lecture at Oxford University about where are the elements in the Earth system where something can go terribly wrong in a sense, collapse of the Amazon rainforest, meltdown of the ice sheets, disruption of the monsoon. And this has become a, a quite active field of research in the meantime uh, because it would mean you have the insidious climate impacts, of course, well, like sea level rise, but you have some uh, subsets of the global machinery where you can have abrupt changes, non -linear, highly nonlinear change, and they are irreversible. Huh? So once you have, for example, uh, achieved a uh, dieback of the Amazon rainforest, it would not be able to reconstitute. Huh? because the water in a tropical forest is cycled on, on the spot, more or less. Uh, 80 to 90% of the water is just recycled. Uh. Once it is gone, it's gone forever. So we must avoid that. And the, the big story behind two degrees is that below two degrees, we assume that most of these elements cannot be activated. While if you go into the three, four, five degrees range, they become highly likely. Uh. So it's really a qualitative difference between below and above two degrees. So green and ash, I have talked about it. And this is now so the second part of my talk, and this is about um, people just declare environmental defeat now, huh? for many reasons, clearly. Uh, it's good for daily business. It's not good for long-term business, but they say, well, we come to accept that global warming is man-made, and it might be a good idea to hold the two degrees line, but it's too late for that. And of course, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy, because if you filibuster about that, for every additional year, it becomes less likely yeah, to hold that line. Yeah? If, we, if people with vested interest achieve another, say, decade of inaction, then the two degrees line will be breached, of course. Eh? It will be too costly to do it in any way. But currently, uh, oh yeah, and I should say, of course, a quick fix would be geoengineering. Uh, you've certainly heard about that. There, is, there are two ways of geoengineering. And I, I did a, a paper about this in Proceedings of the US National Academy called The Good, The Mad, and The Sensible. And MAD refers to mutually assured destruction, that is the, the strategic uh, sort of arms race during the Cold War. Eh? And uh, I would rather turn it in mutually assured decarbonization. So the good way of doing MAD. But there are two ways. You could, people propose, if we are so deeply already in the climate quagmire, you could just send rockets to the stratosphere and allocate uh, sulfur there uh, and dim the sunlight. Uh. No, but in, in, a, in the United States, this is a bipartisan initiative, actually. Uh. The Republicans and the Democrats cannot agree on anything except each year engineering. Uh. It is a completely nonsensical idea, by the way. I mean, it wouldn't work. And how could you assume that the world could agree upon where to put the, the thermostat? Uh. I mean, India might like it a little bit warmer, China a little bit cooler, and so on. I mean, if we cannot even agree on utterly sensible things like 
solar in rural areas, uh, how could we agree upon setting the global temperature? I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, but there's a good way of doing geoengineering that would mean extraction of carbon from the atmosphere uh, by planting trees, for example. Uh, that's a completely sensible thing. So this is uh, a picture everybody should have seen or should see, and actually President Obama had looked at it and many others. This tells you the choice humanity has in the future. And uh, people still tend to not take the climate issue seriously enough. And I think science is not speaking with one voice. But this is encapsulating and epitomizing all what science has to say. So on the right hand side, we have the two fans of temperature development. So, excuse me. So this is uh, 1900, 2000, that's the temperature development. Now holding the two degrees line, that would be the blue fan. It is a fan, not just a line, because all climate models are involved with different uncertainties. Talked about the forest of uncertainty before. Here it's the uncertainty fan. But you see clearly that there is an alternative. And this alternative, the red fan, would be created by this type of global emissions. It's so-called the 8.5 scenario by the IPCC. That means we would keep on emitting and would go up to 100 gigatons of CO2 per year, which is possible. We have enough oil and coal and so on in the ground, although it will be expensive to destroy the planet, but we can achieve it. Uh, so we would do it in the red way here, and then we would get this fan here. That's the median here, so the best guess, if you like. And it means by 2100 it would be, let me see, so we'd have five degrees warming, but it would go on, and by the year 2300 it would be eight degrees warming. That's the, the mean, medium expectation, huh? because the system has a lot of inertia. Eight degrees warming, it means on land 10 to 12 degrees. Now add 10 to 12 degrees average annual temperature on every land on Earth. Uh, I mean, this would render this planet inhabitable. Uh, and uh, as the US comedian Colbert recently said, um, I don't want to spoil my grandchildren with a habitable planet. <laughs> so, well taken. <laughs> You shouldn't spoil your grandchildren. And um, what is the alternative? The alternative, and actually all of climate policy comes down to this faint. I'm looking <laughs> to the department for, what is it, energy? Environment. Uh, environment. Um, all comes down to this faint blue line here. That is the scenario that would create that type of fan. That means we would peak global emissions by 2020, very important, global emissions. <coughs> when we would go down to zero, completely decarbonized by 2070, which is a long time huh? <coughs> still, the peaking is much more difficult to achieve. And when we would have to go negative in carbon emissions, that means it would be a net extraction of carbon from the atmosphere. For example, by uh, planting trees on degraded land and then doing sequestration of the biomass. So probably that is without alternative. But if you do a sober analysis, yes, the two degrees target can still be held. It's technically feasible, it's economically feasible, it's socially feasible, but you need a much enhanced political ambition for that. Huh? Now, another analysis just recently published in Nature Climate Change has looked at several factors that would impinge on the costs of holding the two degrees line. And it's not actually legislation, things like that. The overriding aspect that came out that reduces the costs is early action. So every year you wait. The economic cost eventually will rise steeply. It's not upfront investment on innovation and so on. It's timing. Time is really of the absence here. Huh? So what could be done in Germany? Uh, I chaired the 
Global Change Advisory Council of Germany advising the Chancellor. We did a major report two years ago called The Great Transformation. And this is how the energy mix globally would have to change. So I call this the dark rainbow and it has to be transformed into a fair rainbow. And you can see the usual suspects, of course, uh, so solar, wind, and so on. But in particular, it means that the overall energy consumption would have to peak fairly soon. That means energy efficiency is part of the calculation, clearly. Yeah? If we just crowd out all types of substitution uh, of fossil by solar, then there's no way to go. Uh. But it can be done, and actually the costs are comparable to the cost of just investing into the old system, into the incumbent system. But it's an interesting thing because people always do the fo following trick. They just calculate the upfront investments you need for decarbonizing a society. And they say it is so and so many trillions in addition you have to bring, but they do not calculate the costs you have to, uh, to bring up in order to maintain the incumbent, the incumbent system, also to invest into the replacement uh, of old structures. In the end, it turns out that the difference is marginal, actually. Yeah? So we have clearly a choice in order to, we can create a sustainable energy system and at, as a side effect, save the climate. Or we can just go on with the incumbent system, replace it uh, by some better machinery and rely on Qatar to provide the natural gas for the next two centuries. Uh, the North Field in Qatar actually holds enough natural gas in order to provide humanity f with energy for the next 200 years. Uh, but one should leave it in the ground. Okay, so now more or less my last remark here before I just refer quickly, before the chairman pulls me off the panel. Um, is, uh, and I discussed it with, with Mary Robinson at length this morning, because you know, if you are in charge, if you have a political mandate, of course, like Ban Ki-moon, you think, of course, of top-down of top strategies. Huh? If the world is listening to the science, you draw certain conclusions, a rational strategy, 194 nations together, they sort of come up with a wonderful climate agreement and when it will be implemented, so it will trickle down. But probably this system will not work. Huh? Of course, we will work towards a climate agreement in 2015. The Irish presidency in the EU will hopefully sound the alarm and will say this is still important and so on. Europe will raise its 30% target. 20% uh, target of 30% and so on. It will eventually happen, I'm pretty sure. Huh? But this is not enough. Huh? And actually, Kim, the World Bank president, said when we discussed this, what we need is a social movement, really. Huh? It has to be driven by those people who are really affected, the young generations, uh, those people who will never have access to cheap fossil fuels. Huh? There are many of them in the world and so on. Huh? So. What I think is that the United Nations, they provide just the frame of a big picture. They provide a narrative, if you like. Huh? So you could say the two degrees target, this is a wonderful animation, which you might appreciate. Huh? But it's you know, a very faint picture emerging. You have to bring in, really, NGOs, business, nations, and so on, in order to paint that picture. And in the end, it looks like that. So I really believe in that. This is not just a gimmick. Uh, this really means that it is more or less a bottom-up thing in the end. Uh, you must not, sorry for the politicians in the rooms, but you must not leave the future of our children to the politicians alone. Uh. We have to take responsibility ourselves. So I'm deeply op optimistic about that. And that is actually happening, for example, in Germany right now. You know, Germany decided to phase out nuclear energy overnight after Fukushima, more or less. And uh, still we are exporting a lot of energy to France, for example, who run about 50 nuclear power plants. 
but they have so inefficient heatings that during the winter we have export our wind and solar energy to France. Eh? And uh, now we are at, as I said before, more than 20% uh, renewable electricity. And what happens in Germany is actually the following. Also, we discussed it over lunch, but it is municipalities in particular who community structures and so on. Citizens who buy the grids actually yeah, and provide their own cities and towns and villages with, with energy. So the people become the power producers actually. Yeah. And this is not a social romantic narrative, it is happening on the ground. So in Berlin, for example, the German capital, there will be now a, a motion we call it uh, Volksbegehren, that is a sort of direct democracy instrument, uh, that people will vote for, that the city will buy back the energy producing system uh, from Vattenfall, and it will be, and the investments will come from the citizens actually. Uh, so it will be a million shareholders instead of a few. So that's an interesting thing, and that can happen everywhere on the planet. And of course, you have the five years plan and you have projects in. So let me just finish with two or three slides. Because I was asked, as Chairman said, uh, to, to brief the UN Security Council. Because this is the other chart everybody should be aware of. This is the paleoclimatic evidence. You know, through ice cores and so on, we can reconstruct in a perfect way almost. One of the big triumphs of, of science, really, we can reconstruct year by year, over the last 700,000 years, the, the temperature variations. So even how much dust was in the atmosphere and so on, how acidic the ocean was. It's a fantastic archive. Huh? And this is uh, the last 100,000 years. So if you just run it, so that is how the global mean temperature varied during the last ice age. And then the 11,000 years of grace started, called the Holocene. That is the time when human civilization became a major enterprise. Because you see, it's completely different. It's completely different from what happened before, the Holocene. And at one point in time, actually, here, uh, we can now, through genetic analysis, reconstruct how many human individuals, Homo sapiens, lived at that time. And at that point, it was 15,000 only. 15,000 individuals, as opposed to 7 billion now. Huh? Well, we are about to destroy this climate of grace now and go far beyond this range. Now, this was always appreciated by the Pentagon of all institutions. So when this whole climate skeptics debate came up uh, around Copenhagen, uh, the military people stayed completely cool. Uh. If you are a general, you have to invest a few billion, and you have to take responsibility for 10,000 troops. You don't look at the screwballs uh, who purport that they know the science better than the experts. Uh. You do a very sober analysis. Eh? You have to invest into the right things. Eh? So the Pentagon never faltered regarding the climate analysis. And Chuck Hagel will perhaps become the new defense secretary. I know him a little bit. I had discussions with him on climate change already in 2005. He's a very open-minded person. Eh? And uh, John Kerry is, uh, is the head of uh, State Department who is also somebody very knowledgeable of climate issue. So what I, that was my bottom line, and it's my last slide for the UN Security Council. But it looks very complicated, but I talk you very quickly through that. You know, this debate about, of course, everybody knows that if we have less rain in semi-arid regions, we will have less food production. Huh? So this will probably increase the food prices there. And sea level rise is bad if you have a villa at the beach. 
and, and so on. And malaria might spread into regions where it was never before. But as I told you before, if we, if we leave this window of grace, of climate grace, it may have major implications for national and international security. Yeah? And there has been a lot of debate about this, because in the 1990s, some scholars said, well, you see it in Rwanda, for example. This is a result of too many people packed in a very narrow environmental space. Yeah? So if you have slight fluctuations in harvest and so on, it can create violence. Yeah? And then, of course, in particular, the professional peace researchers who all come from military academies said, oh, no, uh, environment has no impact whatsoever on national security. Yeah? This is bad institutions and so on. And I think they are right, actually. Yeah? So my prediction is, and this is a projection, uh, that if the climate changes at a moderate level, say one and a half degrees, two degrees, there will be actually more cooperation in the world. Huh? If you have transboundary river system, for example. In the end, people haggle and struggle, but finally they come up with an agreement. So there will be more cooperation. The problem is what happens, and I have sort of created a sort of cooperation index. That is, oh, let me go back here. Um, you see, this is eternal peace if the index is plus one and you have world war if it's minus one. Now this is tongue in cheek in a sense, uh, but nevertheless you can come up with a lot of data. And I'm saying present day, if we have a slight additional warming, we'll probably see more cooperation. But then the system will collapse. Uh. So if we go in a four degrees world, if the tipping points will be transgressed, uh, if you have a collapse on monsoon systems and so on, and we have nine billion people by then, there is no way of rational, sh rationally sharing the scarce resources anymore. And this is a story you learn, actually I did that uh, for, a, for a book I'm writing, I looked into the most conspicuous collective crisis you can think of, namely sinking ships the Titanic, the Lusitania, and so on. Eh? And what you see, what you hear from the people who survived these accidents is that as long as people felt by cooperation there is enough lifeboats and rescue space, eh? people behave civilized. Eh? So women and children first and so on. Once people realize there is not enough rescue space, eh? it's struggle for survival and everybody is trampling down each other. Eh? And that is precisely what I fear could happen if we slip into a four or five degrees world. Eh? And that would mean that this index here would completely collapse. Sorry, I'm pushing the wrong button all the time. Um, so this index would drop. Here are the tipping points transgressed. And ultimately, we might go into this age again, 15,000 human beings. We would roam the vast land in small groups, and of course they would co collaborate. So we would see a rise of this index again, but in a completely different world. Now this is not a prediction, obviously. Yeah? I'm sticking my neck out here, clearly. But I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure, from all my gut feeling, that if we would slip into a four degrees or five degrees world, we would see tremendous international tensions, <coughs> national tensions, and something like global climate of violence in the end. Uh, there is an alternative, and I firmly do believe in that, and that is again for the politicians among you. I think that holding the two degrees line is the biggest peacekeeping and peacemaking project of all times, really. That means, you know, you hold the line. I call it a Kantian mega project in the sense of the philosopher Immanuel Kant, who wrote this famous essay on eternal peace. Uh, I think the cooperation on decarbonization, compensation for adaptation and so on, that is the biggest peace project in the world, actually. Uh. And so with this positive prospect, I end my talk. Thanks for your attention.